All right, Congressman, we're live. Thank you very much, Natalie. Good evening, everybody. I'm former Congressman Steve Israel. I now lead the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell University. Sorry about that little delay, but we're going to make it up to you uh, with a scintillating conversation. For those of you who are unaware, the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell University cultivates the next generation of public servants by deepening discourse and raising understanding. Uh, we hope that you'll join us next Wednesday for a discussion with New York Times columnist Peter Baker and Susan Glasser uh, on their new biography of James Baker. Uh, also on Thursday, we'll be in conversation with former Secretary of State John Kerry. And on Thursday also, Thursday's gonna be a busy day at Cornell, uh, we'll be talking with Adam Schiff, Congressman uh, Peter Welch, former Ambassador Tim Romer, uh, exploring the erosion of democracy. Uh, we are launching something called the Campaign for Democracy, uh, which is going to study uh, the electorate and try and figure out why such significant swaths of the electorate seem to be willing to support authoritarian messages, candidates, uh, and other elements. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge uh, several uh, folks who are participating in this. Uh, former Congressman William Enyart uh, is joining us, uh, former Congressman Baron Hill, former Congressman Dan Maffei, uh, Marty Scheinman, who is a Cornell University trustee and active with our institute, New York State Assemblyman Steve Stern, and of course, Roger Tillis, who is a member of the New York State Board of Regents, uh, as well as the education and health staffers of uh, a significant number of sitting uh, members of Congress. In particular, I want to thank Randy Weingarten and Dan Leeds, uh, who are not only participating, but leading us in this conversation. Uh, tonight, education, COVID-19, and the election timeline with a, an extraordinary panel, one of the best we've been able to assemble. The former Secretary of Education, John King, is with us. Jeff Guerin and Stan Greenberg, who I can tell you are the two most respected pollsters in Washington, D.C., John Bailey, who served as a domestic policy advisor to President George W. Bush. Dan Leeds, uh, who co-founded Education Champions, is a Cornellian and a supporter of the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs. And I'm going to launch right into an introduction of our moderator that doesn't do her justice because we, we want to make sure we get into the conversation. And I can't tell you everything I want to tell you about her. Randy Weingarten is the president of the 1.7 million member American Federation of Teachers, AFL-CIO, representing teachers in a broad range of related uh, professionals, including higher education faculty. Uh, prior to her, her election as AFT president in 2008, she served for 12 years uh, as president of the United Federation of Teachers, uh, AFT Local 2, representing approximately 200,000 educators in the New York City public school system. In 2013, the New York Observer uh, named Weingarten one of the most influential New Yorkers of the past 25 years. And that's pretty stiff competition. Uh, and uh, she was also listed by Washington Life magazine uh, in its 2013 Power 100 list of influential leaders. I can tell you as a former member of Congress, when Randy Weingarten walks in a door, whether it is on Capitol Hill or the White House, everybody listens. Randy Weingarten, thank you for moderating this conversation. Take it from here. Thank you, Congressman, and thank you, my friend Steve, and thank you also, let me just say, as a Cornelian, for really helping to create or actually creating this Institute on Politics and Global Affairs. It's really important that Cornell has this kind of institute, and it's frankly, it's only your wisdom and your savviness and the relationships that you have developed over all these years that have created such a powerful lineup and, and a lineup in the run-up of, of the election. So I just really wanted to take a minute to say thank you for doing this and thank you for um, making sure that Cornell is actually a thoughtful partner in terms of both policy and politics. And um, that's what you've done in terms of this um, institute. And so we're honored to be part of this, you know, moment, you know, both as a Cornelian, but also because of what's going on in this world. And, and frankly, it's, it's good to see that education is now one of the, you know, Gallup and others have found it to be a top issue. But frankly, as you said, the three pollsters we have here, and I've worked extensively with Jeff and, Get and Stan and have gotten a lot of guidance from both of them over many, many, many years 
Um, but what is happening right now is you, and you see it in terms of education, is that COVID has dominated our politics. COVID should be dominating our policy. And COVID has actually dominated what is going on in terms of education. Um, the the um, impact of the pandemic on our schools can, and our kids cannot be overstated. Um, I, I spend most of my time talking about how we have a lot of bad choices. And, and frankly, thinking about, and John King and I have spent a lot of hours talking about this too, thinking about how we try to deal with and wrestle with how to keep people safe, how to educate kids, and how to deal with both the short-term and the long-term consequences of the social isolation and the learning loss is something that, frankly, I have nightmares about all the time. We at the AFT knew that reopening schools was gonna take a lot of planning, was gonna be, it was gonna push, even if everything was aligned, even if we had the resources, even if you know, everybody believed in the same, in, in, in public health and in truth, that it was going to be the thing that's, that, that was most, the biggest obstacle that most of us had faced in our entire career. And I've faced, and John has, a lot of obstacles in terms of teaching um, every single child and trying to create a future for every single child. And we put out a plan in April about how to reopen schools safely and the kind of things we needed to think about, including how to deal with all the equity issues that I know John is gonna talk about um, so compellingly. But the federal government refused to create a plan. They refused to resource it. And in fact, they've actually done worse. They've created dissonance and, and, assent, and, and, and have lied about what's really going on in terms of schools and in terms of COVID. And so as a result, there is tremendous chaos and fear and consternation. And frankly, there are very few good choices. And you see the tale of both of these approaches, meaning an approach that tries to use science in New York and a, pl and a plan that tries to deny science in Florida. And the but the consternation everywhere is intense. And so what we wanted to do tonight is that we're, there's lots of other issues that are important in terms of education and in terms of educating our kids. But it's hard to actually start any conversation about education without first actually talking about where parents and teachers are in light of what's going on with COVID. And frankly, one of the best people to do that is someone that we actually asked to do that as over the course of the last several months. And that is Jeff Garin, who has done a bunch of polling about what, you know, about the attitudes and beliefs, of teachers and parents and others in terms of what's going on right now, uh, in terms of their views as we try to reopen schools and try to actually create some sense of normalcy and stability for um, for kids and for teachers and for communities. And so with that, I can say about Jeff, he's not only the president, and there's some weird noise that's going on here. He's not only the president of Heart Research, we have worked <laughs> over years and years and years. He understands, he has a keen understanding of the pulse, not only of our own membership, but where people really are and, 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 and the pulse of the electorate on key issues. You can see the kind of esteem with which he's held because everyone races to see what that NBC Wall Street Journal poll is gonna say every, every week or two. But I often call Jeff just to get a sense, what's the mood of the country? What do you think is going on? He is a friend, he is an advisor, and he is a remarkable poster. And with that, Jeff Barron. Thanks a million, Randy. And I often call Randy to figure out what we should do about what's going on in the country, and nobody's better or smarter about that.
So um, I'm going to uh, share the results of uh, research we conducted on behalf of the AFT. Uh, Natalie is bringing up uh, the slides there. So this is um, uh, uh, the AFT worked with a variety of, of um, partner organizations to survey both uh, parents and teachers. Okay. Natalie, if you can go to the next slide. This was uh, research was uh, conducted right at the very end of August and into the very beginning of September. We interviewed um, a, a sample of parents, including uh, parents of color, uh, and as well as a, um, a sample of representative cross-section of, of public school teachers, uh, and not just AFT members, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the broad, um, uh, broad group of public school teachers across the country. On the next slide, Natalie. So um, the focus of this was the school reopening and, uh, uh, and uh, how to get children and back to school safely. Um, and the first point I'd make is in, that there is kind of a hierarchy of considerations that parents and teachers both uh, bring to this question. That is when we uh, offer them three different considerations that could be brought to bear in terms of thinking about uh, the reopening of school and said which should be the most important uh, factor. You can see that among both uh, parents and among teachers, uh, a lo very large majority say the very first consideration ought to be protecting the health of students and staff and slowing the spread of, uh, of the virus. Uh, and so uh, you can see that, that the, both uh, parents and teachers put that ahead of, um, of the educational and social needs of children and getting parents back to work. Obviously, it doesn't mean that um, either teachers or parents uh, don't, uh, don't care particularly about the educational and social needs of children. They desperately uh, care about those things. But, um, but uh, first, the first order of business is to make sure that um, decisions are being made um, through the prism of protecting the health of students and staff. On the next slide, um, just carrying this point um, further, uh, we asked uh, our respondents uh, what is the uh, bigger concern they have about the reopening of schools, that school districts will move too quickly to fully reopen uh, in a way that risks the safety of students, families, and teachers, or, or that school districts will move too slowly, leaving students further behind academically and leaving working parents with no good options. Again, um, that these are this is a Hobson's choice. Both of these things are are, are outcomes that 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 uh, that nobody is really looking for. But in a world of choices, you can see that the bigger concern, again, for both parents and uh, and teachers, and particularly for parents of color, is that schools will reopen too quickly at the risk of the safety of students and staff and, and, and their families. Um, next slide. Uh, now, having said all of that, uh, that the both parents uh, and uh, to a lesser extent, but a significant, significant extent, uh, teachers would like there to be some face-to-face um, -face in person interactions in the schools. So when we ask uh, what they want for their own school, you can see that uh, very few believe that um, uh, that schools can and should reopen on a normal in-person basis. Only one in five parents and uh, and uh, only 14% of teachers. But there is uh, 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 an appetite for a hybrid model of in-person and remote learning that some, not all, school districts are. Adapting, um, there are significant um, minority of parents who say remote learning only. Forty-three uh, percent. That's particularly true among uh, African American parents, and then um, uh, among uh, teachers, a uh, five out of nine majority say that um, for the time being, 
schools should continue with, uh, with uh, remote learning only for an additional period of time. On the next chart, um, this follows a question that, that uh, I'll tell you about the results in, in a little bit, where the majority of both parents and teachers said that they're not comfortable about uh, that returning to work themselves or, or having their child return to school. And that's really about safety uh, more than any a gener general concern uh, for safety um, um, and kind of in a very personal way. And, uh, and this is something that both parents and staff think about um, in, in, in personal terms. But you can see that for, for teachers, they're not just thinking about their own safety. 79% um, are uncomfortable about returning to work because they worry as well about the safety of, of their students. Uh, and so that, that uh, while they're concerned about their own personal safety, the safety of students is, uh, is a very important consideration uh, for, for teachers. Next chart. Um, at the time we did this, uh, as many of you will recall, President Trump and Secretary DeVos were, were, were pushing for um, a back to school um, uh, plan and, um, and they uh, were threatening to withhold uh, federal funds to schools that did not reopen. Uh, the public uh, rejected that uh, much as they reject many other parts of, of President Trump's uh, handling of the coronavirus crisis. So you can see among parents by 55 to 45, they disapprove of the threat of withholding federal funds from schools. Uh, and among people who have strong feelings about it by two to one, they strongly disapprove more than uh, strongly approve. And then teachers um, um, uh, uh, overwhelmingly disapprove of this idea. And you can see in this note here that that when we ask what, what's motivating President Trump, people do not think that, that his, uh, his desire to get schools reopened has anything to do with the well being of students. People really don't think of President Trump as an education president. They really think it's motivated by other things his concern for the economy and his concern for himself um, as much as anything else. On the next chart, uh, you know. So that, uh, you know, while people have these very clear concerns and reservations about a reopening, they want to get their uh, students back to school. They want to be back working in schools if they're teachers. And they think there's a way to do that, um, that um, we presented a reopening plan very much along the lines of the plan that Randy uh, mentioned that the AFT had proposed as early as April. And, uh, and, and long and the short of it is that if schools are taking the proper precautions to make sure that, that, uh, that students are protected, that, that works in a transitional way through hybrid learning and then ultimately in per, uh, full in-person learning when safety measures are in place, uh, you can see among both parents and, and, and teachers, eight out of 10 are, are supportive of that uh, on the next chart. Um, in terms of what it means to uh, be able to reopen safely, uh, here are some of the things that both parents and teachers in common prioritize. Uh, daily deep, deep cleaning of schools, um, make sure that if people are at high medical risk, they have an alternative to, uh, to um, uh, in-person uh, learning. Uh, many school buildings are old, um, sadly, and, but, but it's... Uh, reality of the situation. They want to make sure that the ventilation systems in schools, whether old or new, are functioning uh, properly and that there, uh, there's more access to um, fresh air in, uh, in schools, uh, that there be personal protective equipment, uh, and, that, um, and that physical distancing be uh, adopted uh, as part of the strategy for school reopening. Um, on the next slide, I won't uh, narrate this, but the, you know, the, the list goes on. So that, you know, the, th the thing about all of these, some of them require resources. And we know that both parents and teachers recognize they require resources, but 
if there's a real commitment to the education of students uh, and to getting kids uh, back to school and teachers back to work there, I think most uh, Americans believe that our leaders ought to be investing um, those kinds of resources much in the way that was envisioned in the HEROES Act, for example. On the next uh, chart. Um, so uh, I mentioned earlier that the majority said that they were uncomfortable um, uh, sending, going either going back to school or sending their kids back to school. If there is kind of a common sense reopening plan that makes a real investment in safe reopening of schools, that changes everything for both parents and teachers. If, if they know that these investments are being made, that the steps are being taken to ensure the safety of students and staff, and to make sure that when, when they go home, they're not carrying the virus to their family and loved ones. Uh, there's a, 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 a this very large surge in the percentage of people who say that they'd be comfortable sending their, uh, uh, with, with a uh, school reopening in, on an in-person basis. On the next chart, um, and uh, we also asked about uh, remote learning. Uh, and, you know, parents uh, say it worked um, as well or nearly as well um, as uh, school did. There's not a lot of avidity behind that. But you can see the teachers, you know, teachers say that uh, very frequently, we, we want nothing more than to be back with our kids. They really mean that they don't in, in part because they don't you know think that remote learning is particularly a great experience for for uh, for students that it that it works as well as having that kind of interaction uh, and so uh, you know there is a recognition among teachers about the um, challenges of remote learning and, and, and how well it works for uh, for children and it creates a lot of obstacles not only for children, but for parents on the next chart. Um, uh, you can see here as you kind of dig more deeply into it uh, in terms of whether um, it had a, uh, a positive effect on uh, their child staying on track academically and uh, their ch children's social and emotional well-being. More parents are concerned about the impact that, that uh, remote um, uh, learning has had on children's social and emotional uh, health and well-being. Um, and we're, uh, in fact, I was in a conversation today about research we're about to uh, undertake a, about the role of um, SEL, social emotional learning, um, uh, in uh, as students go back to school and dealing with both the COVID crisis and the racial justice crisis in, in, in the country. And as part of that, conversation, uh, Randy, both Randy and Secretary King were cited um, uh, uh, and we'll be thinking about their uh, good thoughts on this but as we're preparing that research. But you can see there is a concern about the social emotional health of children and the impact of being isolated in this way uh, has on them. On the next chart. Um, and uh, there's also, it takes a toll on parents as well as on the social emotional well-being of the student. Um, uh, adults need to be with their kids and for many parents uh, that's a challenge, not for all, but for, um, for an important segment of, of the parent body. And then a um, the next chart, Natalie. Uh, and you know there are many just as there are many things that can be done to make sure that, that schools can reopen safely, uh, parents and um, identify a whole host of things that would be particularly helpful to them uh, in, um, in, in making remote learning as uh, effective and um, uh, as possible. Uh, so things like uh, online access for parents to see their assignments and grades, guidance, uh, you know, more hands-on guidance for parents about how to do this and not just academic guidance, but also tech guidance, the available availability of tutoring. So there's this kind of massive challenge and, um, and, uh, and it's really a question of whether um, school systems are able to rise to the challenge to provide these kinds of 
supports for parents um, and, uh, in, in order to make the best of a bad situation. That's really what parents are asking for is, is some help in making the best of a, of a really challenging situation. Uh, and then on the next chart, we, um, I do, uh, the, just as this is a challenge for parents, it's a challenge for teachers. Uh, you can see that um, the hybrid system and, and remote learning both uh, entail a lot, a lot more work uh, than, um, than teaching everybody in person as, as teachers are used to doing. And um, finally, on the next slide, um, you know, there are real consequences here um, that teachers are in, worried about their health, but um, we, we already have a, um, a, a crisis in the country in terms of teacher retention. And, um, uh, and you can see here that um, as a result of the pandemic, a third of all the teachers we interviewed said that they are more likely to leave teaching or retire early. Uh, so um, you know the toll on we, the toll on teachers is something that 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 really deserves um, attention here, and that's particularly true among more senior teachers as well as teachers in the South. So uh, let me leave it there. I'm eager to hear um, uh, Stan and 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 John and Secretary King's comments as well. Thank you, Jeff. And I've been answering a couple of the questions that are in the chat already. But let me also let me get to um, and you know I, I think you know part of this polling, and I think you're going to see it in stands as well, is that there is um, this yearning for normalcy and for actually getting us all back to in-person learning for lots of different reasons but you're seeing a lot of the impacts in this polling of the you know fear of you know of of, of people's safety you're seeing it of the fear of the loss of of um socialization and again as jeff said um both um john king and i are really big believers in having to meet the child uh, meet children where they are and really dealing with all of the social emotional impacts here and focusing on well-being. The one thing that Jeff, you notice, there's a lot, a lot of the stuff that Jeff was talking about costs a lot of money. I, let me just say one other thing, which is we were, given that the Trump administration actually did try to pit parents against teachers, um, I think it's really salient and really impressive to see just how much teacher and, um, and parent opinion are pretty consistent throughout the, the polling. We're, um, the, the polling, the, the other, and look, it feels like family here because when we're not doing polling with Jeffrey, we're doing polling with Stan. And we just did, uh, you know, I'm just um, making sure people know our, um, you know, the, the, the kind of polling and the kind of relationships we all have. Um, Stan Greenberg does a lot of, of kind of um, dials, really understanding people's emotions and energy and activity. Um, he is amazing in terms of the polling that he does in terms of dials. And, and we have worked with him a lot in terms of really kind of assessing attitudes and beliefs um, uh, very deeply in either debates or before and after. And what Stan, who is a New York Times bestselling author, and he has been a polling advisor to presidents, to prime ministers, to CEOs globally, and right now is conducting multiple deep research in multiple countries. But what Stan's sweet spot is, is really focused on the economy and economic impacts, um, particularly on working families. And I think you're gonna see a lot of, of um, consistency between Jeff's polling and Stan's polling on these issues. Um, and so without further ado, um, another dear friend and someone who I rely on ex and fight with extensively and rely on extensively, Stan Greenberg. 
Um, thank you, Randy. And um, um, I'm, an, I'm an admirer. Um, and I, I, obviously we're collaborating on so many projects and trying to bring change that's so critical. Uh, but you're also, but you're just in a different place you're, because you lead across not just the labor movement. I mean, I think we're all looking you during this crisis uh, on how this country addresses its most fundamental problems, inequality, racial injustice, um, and which is now playing out through all our work. So we, uh, so thank God you uh, support people like Jeff and our work um, so that we can dig deep and try to understand uh, what's happening. I hey, what a, let me just say before Stan starts, what a shock that some of us actually believe in science and look at data as a way of trying to figure out, you know, what um, um, some of the things we should be doing. What a shock. What, what a shock. <laughs> and, I, and I should mention that I'm, um, I'm in the kitchen because my wife is in the, is in the office and uh, where she's doing her Zoom. Um, you know, pres uh, presentation. And I should mention that my daughter who's a pollster uh, was a graduate of Cornell in case you wanna bring her, you should, you should have brought her into this, Anna Greenberg. Uh, but let me, let me talk about education champions that uh, supported this work. And I know how important the AFT uh, was in uh, <clears throat> focusing in on what we could do to get education champions um, at this critical you know, moment. And um, let's move to the, slide just to the to the methodology, the fact that we you know, polled in 3,000 interviews, key states, particularly Senate states, Arizona, Georgia, Iowa, you know, Maine, uh, Michigan, Montana, North Carolina. Uh, and the, and we'll go to the next slide. But what we discovered very quickly is that education has become such a focus of everything because the school has become this battle uh, where this coronavirus is playing out and where the hard choices take place with our kids. There's no, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's no choice uh, but to make the right choice. Um, and in some sense, conservative choices that people are taking for their, you know, families. By the way, I did not include in here the findings that I knew would overlap with uh, what Jeff had presented. But this, the starting point for people is trust the local schools, trust the teachers, um, trust the scientists when you decide whether you're gonna send kids back into the schools. Um, let it be done locally and let it be done with facts, let it be done with those who are the stakeholders um, and people who uh, bring us education. Um, the whole debate is just so alien to how people wanna think about educating their children and their families. And so that, you know, that's kind of given. So I've, I didn't present that because the, uh, it's the starting point because what's so interesting, we kind of started this with, all right, can we find education voters you know, that can affect Senate races? And what we found is that the focus on the schools has created such huge issues that the, the small issues just became huge um, and the future is now. You know, when we began testing things like what, you know, what are the big things you can do to transform education? People wanna deal with that now. They think that's what you have to come to terms with now because this crisis has, you know, has raised people's consciousness about a whole range of things that they wanna address. So the intense school debate, is kind of a new consciousness about education, include, including the digital divide, internet access to racial and income inequality, in the education system, dealing with learning loss, adapt, adapting education to new environment caused by the pandemic. So they face acute economic issues, but it's pushed out these issues right to the front. And what happens as a result of discussing these issues is that you jump the number of education voters by 10 points by just having this kind of discussion. So the, if campaigns are focusing on these issues, but if communities are focusing on the, these issues, you're creating a, a huge number of voters who say education is their top issue. So when we started at the beginning of this survey, where we're asking about the economy, jobs, all you know, all kinds of things, climate, et cetera, you know, 13% were saying education, but it jumps to a quarter 
um, when you have any kind of discussion about education issues. And that's particularly true in Iowa, Michigan, uh, Maine, uh, and Montana. Um, and there really is a, you know, 21% who say they, they are much more likely to vote for a Senate candidate who prioritizes education. And there's 15% who say will definitely get involved in talking to other people to influence what they're thinking on education. And what you see are their education voters. And that education voters is a mix of African-American women, white millennial women, Hispanic women, and white working class women. And that is a powerful mix, a powerful brew for changing the shape of uh, the education and economic debate. Let me go to the data. So at the outset of this survey, you know, 13% chose education. Keep in mind, we're talking about the economy, managing, managing the public health crisis, uniting the country, there are huge issues. Getting people back to work, huge issues, healthcare. But education is 13, but it jumps to 23%, uh, picking it as a, amongst these issues as a most important problem once you begin to focus on the issues that we are talking about that Jeff was talking about, that Randy was talking about, and we'll talk about, you know, in the survey. Go to the next slide. What you see is the, the jump in education, people saying education is a, a number one issue for them. It happens again, it happens in these battleground states and these Senate states. It happens both in the large metro and the rural. So we're not confined, we're not confined to a big metro area. This is a unifying issue once you begin to focus on the problems that have emerged out of the pandemic. Go to the next slide. Um, these are the groups that shifted, and when and and there you're talking about enormous shifts. So if you look at African American women, you go from 19 percent to 39 percent who flag education as a top issue amidst that long list. For white college women, it jumps to a quarter. It jumps to a third for white millennial women. You know, 22 percent for white working class women, and for you know to almost a third for Hispanic women, both at the beginning and end of the survey. So we are, these are issues of great intensity, you know, that have arisen out of this awful pandemic that's made education so central and, so, and linked to so many big economic, social, uh, and racial issues. Go to the next slide. Um, here, we, you know, here we ask people, you know, would you, would you, you know, become involved with an organization that works to deal with education issues? It's 15% um, who say that. It's bigger up for people that are directly involved in the schools, but here you get the overlap with the education champions that emerged you know, earlier in the study. And you see the millennial men, uh, millennials of color, you know, white millennials um, are at 27% who will say they will organize, talk to other people about this issue. Uh, and it's with, strong with black women and strong with Hispanic women and democratic women. Next slide. So we start with the um, with the point that is like that Randy has emphasized that you know runs through Jeff's people start with schools opening too soon and teachers, students and their families getting sick is the number one short term problem people are thinking about and obviously it's the biggest priority and you have to if you can't get if you can't solve that you can't get to the other things but it is critical to see what other things they are saying students falling behind in school. Some children not having access to the internet and computers, parents losing income because they can't work, um, the mental health impact on students and their families. So just think about the shape on people's consciousness of there being this, people having forced to deal with this crisis in the schools, a badly managed corona, uh, pandemic crisis leads to a thinking about all these other issues that have to be addressed if we're gonna deal with the uh, get the schools back and the, and the society back. Go to the next one. Here you see what happens with different, you know, segments that be, uh, of groups that, be, that became, you know, education movers. So if you, you know, look, the students falling behind in school, it jumps for, you know, for Hispanic women. Uh, if, you, if you look at some children not having internet access, you see it's very, it's very strong with African-American women. Uh, but also, you know, with white working class women, 
when you look to parents' income falling behind, it's very much it's white millennial women at the, you know, at the top and mental health, African-American women are there. Uh, when you get the children falling behind, uh, it is Hispanic women. And you see that the, yes, you have the big issues that go right to schools opening safely, but groups are being affected by this in very different ways. And it's raising up a whole range of related education issues that will shape the education priorities that people will turn to. Next. Now, here we looked at the government response again in the short term, you know, what should be done now? Um, and, you know, it's important that at the fund at the top of that is new funding for K-12 um, that deals with the uh, the crisis, but right behind that is the digital divide and technology um, and funding for lifelong learning and special education, um, allowing uh, those without incomes to defer you know federal student loan, but a whole broad range of issues emerge. And go to the next slide, and you can see where you know what where that breaks out you know by you know by group. You know, new funding, you know, it's important that, you know, that, you know, across the board, very, you know, it's very strong, but you get to the digital divide, Hispanic women, white working class women are at the top, you know, at the top of that. So there's just a new priority now that come to a whole range of issues that affect education and obviously uh, the social and economic standing for people. You know, funding for lifelong learning, technical and adult education, you know, it's highest for white working class women who get drawn into this education debate. And then when you get to increase services to students disproportionately impacted by the crisis, uh, you get African-American women, you know, uh, at the top, you know, but also white millennial women um, bringing, you know, coalitions uh, for education priorities that emerge out of this crisis. Go to the next slide. I mean, here you see what's, what's interesting is what happens with Republicans uh, who are responding to this crisis, but we should recognize that they do give the highest point to new funding for K-12. Um, and that obviously is number one priority if we're gonna deal with anything in the aftermath. But digital divide, is a Republican and you know an independent issue and, and what white working class men. And so it's a bipartisan, but you, you begin to have a broader bipartisan reach once you get into the digital divide uh, across the beyond the education champions we identified earlier. Next slide. Go past this as a repeat. We then went to like all right, long term. Let's think big, you know, what are, what are we testing in this that, that thinks about kind of long-term challenges to the schools? You know, redesigning pre, uh, you know, pre-K, so it includes strong components of problem solving, academics, the arts, mental, physical health, living skills, civics, you know, you know based on the best research. Um, then we went to, you know, expanded affordable internet access to all Americans, you know, big infrastructure development to bring in a broad internet access software needed um, so that people have access to learning and then recognizing the highest unemployment will need kind of a, a GI bill level of, you know, of, of, you know, of training, um, you know, for, uh, you know, for Americans. So these are like big ideas that the community that worked, that worked with us on this project came forward to. But when you thought about it, these are the things that have to happen now. <laughs> this is like, five years from now or two years from now, this is what the next president is gonna to have to deal with. And next, obviously next Senate will have to, uh, have to deal with. And so when you look at these issues, if you go to the next slide, uh, what you see is, you know, what happens with different groups on, you know, on these different, you know, priorities. Um, and if you look at minority millennial women, you know, that, you know, they go off the, off the charts for, you know, for redesigning, uh, you know, schools. Um, and, that, you know, and that's also, you know, you know, you know, very strong for white millennial women um, and Hispanic women. You know, so women, thank God for women. Women <laughs> across almost every group are going for that redesigning, you know, you know, K twelve. Uh, but then you also see the expanded internet access, but thought about in, you know, in a in a very big way. Um, you know, is also you know, it's very strong for Republicans uh, and and uh, and and independents. Um, and, uh, and white working class women. 
um, then recognizing, you know, that we have to have a GI level bill for, you know, for, you know, for, uh, you know, for training, uh, you know, also, you know, hits, uh, you know, some groups, uh, you know, such as the white working class women. White working class women are really being drawn into this. They were not our education champions, but there you see on issue after issue, they're being drawn in. There are parts of what's happening in this crisis that are bringing them, you know, you know into this. Um, go to the next slide, which is our last slide. Uh, this is, you know, just going back to the fact that what this whole, you know, exercise was that it allowed us to learn is that when you, at the beginning of the survey, you have 13% choosing education out of a long list um, as a number one problem, it jumps. And you have, you know, a, you know a, you're in a whole different place. People have a whole new consciousness. And clearly this is both what's happening in the real world as these education issues get debated, but it's also in our hands you know, to raise these issues, uh, which are obviously things people want to embrace as we come to terms with the crisis. And thank you, Randy, for playing such a leadership role in making this happen. Thank you, Stan. And I, you know what, look, Jeff and Stan, and I'm dying to hear um, John's responses to this, but Jeff and Stan, you know, are known to be more of democratic pollsters. Um, even though um, in the first poll that Jeff did, you know, one was was about parent, really parent and teacher attitudes across the country, and we did it with four um, parent groups. Um, but you know, but we really wanted, I'm really, really, really um, appreciative of Steve really saying to us as as Dan and I were trying to stand up this program, we need to actually have someone who's viewed as a Republican pollster. And um, so it's really fabulous to have John Bailey. John's experience has spanned government, philanthropy, private sector, worked, and he's worked on a range of different issues, including tech and immigration, the future of work, economic mobility. He serves as a Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Fellow He's a visiting fellow at AEI, American Enterprise Institute. He, he is a fellow at the George W. Bush Institute. You are a very busy man. And he is an advisor to the Walton Family Foundation. And he has also done this kind of work of looking at you know, what families are thinking about in terms of education and the work. Um, he's done some polling that was sponsored by so Stan's polling was sponsored by Education Champions. Jeff's polling was sponsored by us, by AFT. And, um, and John's polling, this one was sponsored by Walton, um, Annie Casey, and others. So take it away, John, and thank you really for being here with us today. Oh my gosh, uh, thank you. It's an uh, honor to be with everyone, and especially with these, these polling legends. I am not a polling legend. I'm just a, a policy wonk. Um, uh, what I was asked to do, and I'll be very short, is just to cover a, a narrow sliver of some of the polling that we've done, mostly on the digital divide. Um, uh, at the Walton Family Foundation, we've been uh, commissioning polls almost since uh, the, the very, very early days of COVID. And it's to try to understand what is going on with schools, what is going on with parents, what's going on with teachers, and just the communities in general. Uh, we did an eight-week series of polling. Um, it's got about 3,000 different types of crosstabs with it. Uh, started seeing like very early, as far back as April, uh, a very nervous set of parents. Like much of the, the challenges that we're facing now with whether or not parents feel safe to send their kids back to school or not, we actually had early warning indicators of that going all the way back to April. Um, but obviously, uh, if parents are keeping their kids at home, if we're keeping kids at home because of the safety issues in terms of bringing them back into the classroom, it just brings up other types of inequities and other challenges. And one of the fundamental ones is just this digital divide that uh, in the past, we called this the homework gap, because if a uh, student wasn't, didn't have a computer, or didn't have internet connectivity at home, it meant they couldn't connect and do their homework assignments at night. Now it's much more fundamental. Now it means that uh, parents and, and their kids don't have access to instruction, don't have access to courses, don't have access to learning. They're essentially shut out of learning. And so closing this divide 
uh, is the, the most obvious thing that Congress could do. And yet we're, we're finding just uh, not a lot of movement on that front. What I'm going to do is just share a, a couple different polling. And I just want to explain the strategy that uh, uh, Stan and Jeff are great pollsters, amazing pollsters. You should trust their data. Uh, we wanted to go with, um, with people, not because we didn't trust uh, Stan or Jeff, but we wanted to go with a couple of Republican pollsters who had relationships with the Senate. And part of that is that sometimes it's the message uh, that, and the data that you get from the polling, and sometimes it's the messenger, meaning how do we make sure that we're having a trusted sort of messenger that's carrying some of these messages on the urgency of care, uh, closing the digital divide up to the members in the Senate uh, and sometimes into the administration, and hopefully to kind of be able to build uh, some of that momentum that we need to close this divide. So let me just share my screen and I'll just talk through uh, a handful of slides here. Um, but real quick, um, one of the first polls we did was with uh, Fabrizio Lee Associates, which is a, a polling firm that's been working with McConnell, it's been working with a number of senators, all sort of uh, Republicans. And we did polling in a, in a number of um, the really close races, uh, both in the Senate as well as in the presidential, and uh, Louisiana, North Carolina, and Kentucky, poll parents. And then we did two other surveys that I'll just lightly touch on, one with uh, Frank Lentz, which is always kind of entertaining, and then Echelon Insights with uh, the wonderful Kristen Solcer Sanderson there. But what we found with the Fabrizio Lee um, uh, survey is that uh, there was broad support uh, for a congressional package. In this case, we tested a number of different languages and different types of concepts. This one was just, at the time, Congress was thinking about $4 billion to close the homework gap, to, get, to help make sure kids had the devices and the connectivity they needed to participate in learning. What you see is that uh, in the polling that we did in Louisiana, North Carolina, Kentucky, there was broad support amongst uh, uh, Republicans, independents, uh, and amongst Democrats, often higher with Democrats but still very strong support across the board. We also asked a number of other questions, but one of those is that if this candidate, if the candidate in this contentious race supported that $4 billion proposals, would you be more or less willing uh, to vote for them uh, or to have no impact on your vote? And what you see is mostly no impacts, but again, some pretty favorable ones with McConnell. Uh, GOP was a quarter of GOP voters are more likely to support McConnell in his reelection if he supported the $4 billion package. And you see this kind of across the board with um, a number of the other races there too. Uh, we also tested a number of different uh, arguments for why it was critical to close uh, the homework app to give kids uh, internet connectivity. And you know there, there almost wasn't a bad option, a uh, bad argument for this, but what you see is a couple different ones sort of jump out at you that uh, greater access to broadband or internet connectivity will level the playing field to help every student. That was one that pulled really high. Um, the other one, which should make, you know, should not be surprising, but is so key to kind of keep reinforcing is the last one is what we did is we contextualized it to the state that if you supported the $4 billion, it would provide, uh, uh, home internet access for X number of thousands of students in that state. And that was uh, off the charts in terms of support. And that makes sense that people are going to galvanize around something that's going to immediately help themselves, their community, their state, more than sort of an amorphous type of national uh, type of proposal. But again, there was almost no bad arguments in this. Um, we also did some Frank Luntz polling, which Frank is a, is a bit of a creative uh, and, and, and an interesting sort of fella. But again, like, I, I think the key message to take away here is that even though he's a different pollster, had a different methodology, he was seeing a lot of the same type of data, that there was broad support amongst Democrats, swing voters, and the GOP uh, that agreeing that uh, students needed internet connectivity. And then we also posed a number of different ways of testing this. Do you believe the federal government should, uh, should provide funding, or do you support that? And even amongst GOP voters in the Frank Luntz, found 52% agree. Uh, obviously high support amongst Dems and even 72% amongst swing voters. So, you know, I, I throw this up just to sort of show that like sometimes you have to look at the trend that multiple polls are showing. And this was showing broad support uh, for the urgency of it and broad support amongst the different type of voters too. Just one other thing that uh, came out of the Frank Lentz polling too is that we did different types of language. And what they found is that 
what would make someone more likely to support federal funding was emphasizing the positive, what students had to gain, not what they had to lose. And so you can see these two different types of sta uh, statements that academic studies prove that students with reliable high speed internet connectivity perform much better in their education uh, than sort of highlighting uh, from a deficit sort of mindset. And so I, I share all that with you and I, I'll just be very quick so we could jump right to the conversation. But uh, it was, uh, we have a lot of other slides, a lot that uh, reinforce what you just heard from Stan uh, and with Jeff, that you have uh, parents who are really giving a lot of grace to school systems, but I, I worry we're running out of that grace bank, that the people are frustrated, they're getting concerned about the well-being of their kids, uh, as well as them falling further and academically behind. And it really is just going to be incumbent upon Congress to, to move faster than what they have in order to make sure schools have the resources to not only get online learning right and to close the digital divide, but also to have uh, the uh, safety and all the other equipment and preparations they need to safely get kids back into school. So, uh, Randy, that was really quick, but I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, and your conversation we with really appreciate it. And, you know, I, I think when you see John's polling and Frank Luntz's polling, what you're also seeing and your understanding is that why um, uh, the even the Republican Senate skinny bill, which personally I had a lot of problems with, had a lot of money that was dedicated to education. So it was a, but, but they couldn't move it over the top to get, you know, so, so there was an urgency, but not such an urgency that they would actually negotiate a COVID stimulus bill. Um, but you see where, you know, parent based is, you know, whether it's Republican or Democratic, and I'm going to kind of turn it over to John and ask him as he's shaking his head, because I think, you know, this is one of those areas in, in the United States that could actually serve as a basis for um, depolarizing so much of what's going on if we can actually um, deep depolarize education will always be political but if we can start depolarizing education and start really thinking about education through the lens of values and opportunity everyone wants to spend more in terms of as long as what it's spent on is something that people see as really really important um, but I want to actually John was John King just so everyone knows president and CEO of the Education Trust which is a national nonprofit organization to, that really focuses on the vulnerable, that seeks to identify and close education op opportunity gaps throughout the country. And, and John had served as US Secretary of Education in the Obama administration after Ar Arne Duncan. And before that, he was Deputy, Deputy Secretary overseeing policies relating to B12 at the US Department of, of Education. And before that, he was the New York State Education Commissioner. And before that, John and I serve or share the love of teaching social studies um, to high school students. And with that, John, you've just seen a whole lot of things. And so why don't you just tell us your top of the mind responses to what you've seen? Sure, thanks, thanks, Randy. Thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this conversation. Thank you. Congressman Israel for organizing us, and it's a pleasure to follow uh, Jeff and Steve and, and, and John. I, you know, th this this conversation is actually quite heartening about democracy, right? Because part of what you see is that the public really understands what's at stake here. When you see folks saying we've got to prioritize public safety and the health of kids and teachers, that's they're exactly right. In some ways, it's surprising that that is a universal belief, but they're exactly right about that. As you pointed out in the chat, Randy, it's not surprising to see higher rates of concern about health and safety from African-American parents in particular, given the disparate impact COVID has had on uh, African-Americans and Latinos throughout the country. Black and Latino folks three times as likely to get COVID, twice as likely to die from it when they do. Um, it's also encouraging to see the level of consensus around a phased safe reopening, despite all the politics around this. I think most parents understand that, and most teachers understand, it would be better if kids were in school, but we have to do it safely, and a phased responsible approach is the, is the right one. 
I also think you see in this polling really an extension of the pre-COVID uh, fears about inequities. As, as John pointed out, we had a homework gap before. People are right to be very concerned about the digital divide. Uh, we know from a Pew study that was done before COVID, about 79% of white families have reliable internet access, 66% of black families, 61% of Latino families. So that was the context pre-COVID onto which we layered this crisis that forced everyone online. Uh, we know there are device gaps still. Kids who are uh, doing their homework and their learning on their mom's cell phone because they don't have devices. The public gets that and has a sense of urgency about it. It's frankly shocking that Congress has not acted on this. We knew in the spring the consequences of this digital divide in this moment. We knew we were gonna have schools that would be remote or hybrid in the fall, and we didn't make the investment necessary. Uh, the concern about learning loss that we see in the polling is also verified by research on what happens to students when they miss a lot of school. McKinsey did a study recently suggesting that the average learning loss from the spring and fall would be about seven months. Uh, nine months for Latino students, 10 months for African-American students. Um, and the, the concern you see throughout the polling around socio-emotional well-being, uh, I think is very real. And we've done some polling at Ed Trust showing also very high levels of parent stress. They are worried about their kids' socio-emotional well-being and their own socio-emotional well-being has been hurt by this crisis, particularly we see very high rates of stress amongst parents of kids with disabilities. Um, so all of this polling data should then lead us to ask why in a democracy has that not translated into congressional action? Why is it that we still don't have action on a stimulus bill that would direct the resources that schools need to avoid cuts, which is what's going to happen if Congress doesn't act? The schools desperately need the resources to have PPE and ventilation and their strong public support for that, but we haven't seen Congress act. We haven't seen Congress act on, Randy, you and I talked about this in the op-ed we did in the spring. I was gonna say, how many months ago did we talk about this? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Kids have this learning loss, we know that, so we should be investing additional resources and extending learning time. You know, the, the United Kingdom is doing a national tutoring core to try to respond to, to learning loss. We haven't acted on that. Uh, Congress hasn't acted on that. Congress hasn't acted on the additional mental health supports and the need for more counselors. That, that's desperately obvious. I guess the thing that I will close on that, that is hopeful though that you see in the polling is, I do think there is this broader public understanding of the stakes here. You see this, especially I, I thought in some of the, the data points that Stan shared where parents are seeing the importance of socio-emotional learning. So maybe they will put more pressure on their state legislators to close the counselor gap. Um, you know, the, the American School Counselor Association recommends 250 students per counselor. We have states where it's more like 600 students per counselor. You see parents more appreciative of the relationship between childcare and folks' ability to work. There are some folks uh, who never worried about childcare before because they're affluent and they just assumed it would always be there. Now they've seen how hard it is to work without childcare. And so maybe this is a moment where we have the political will to, to finally provide universal high quality childcare zero to four. Um, maybe this is a moment, I certainly hear folks saying this, how much more they appreciate teachers and how hard the job of teachers is uh, day to day. And so maybe this is a moment where people say, well, we ought to pay teachers um, decently based on how hard the job is. So maybe there's a way in which this crisis will create a stronger constituency for education investments and education equity investments in particular. Thank you, John. I think that, and I, I'm about to introduce Dan Leeds, um, or Steve, are you introducing Dan Leeds? I, no, I think you're going to introduce Dan Leeds, Randy. Right. But I, do, I do want to very quickly, because I know we're closing in about four minutes, uh, I, I want to tell Secretary King how, how honored we are to have you on uh, and agree with, with you that it is shameful that Congress has not acted. 
But as an old House member, I, I do feel compelled to remind everybody that one chamber of, of the United States Congress House member. acted last May and has been waiting for the other chamber to, uh, you know, to, to, to join the conversation in a serious way. Well you said. Take, you can take the congressman out of the Congress, but you can't take Congress out of the congressman. I feel compelled to get that in. Randy, back to you. Thank you. And, you know, I, I want to um, just, uh, you know, I think that there is a moment and not to be um, too political here. I think that there is a moment that in the aftermath of, of hopefully November 3rd, that um, will be a renaissance for public education because I think what we can do is that we can actually wrap services around schools like we've seen in other community schools and use that kind of infrastructure building to kind of meet the, all sorts of different accordion needs of kids. And I think that there will be an impetus and you see that from all this polling to actually not forsake our future and not forsake children, particularly the most vulnerable of children. Because I think parents, regardless of where they sit right now and regardless of their income level are very, very, very concerned about all of what's going on. And normally what happens is that when you see that kind of consensus, you see a real push to doing bold action. And I know that as, as Jeff said earlier, John and I work on this virtually every single day, but it is really gratifying to see the kind of polling that, 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 uh, that is showing that where, where the public and parents are about the need to create this kind of equity and the need to actually make sure that our kids, that we do not lose a generation of kids because of this pandemic. And I just wanted to, and, and one of the reasons that we have gotten to some of these places and we don't have the kind of education wars that, 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 um, uh, that you saw 10 or 15 years ago is because of Dan Leeds. Because what Dan has done is that he has, you were wondering how I was gonna get to that introduction. You were, it, because what Dan has done is that Dan has had these salons for years and years about what to do, how to um, bring people together. In some ways, he did it well before the New York Times brought 500 and so odd people together from different kind of vantage points to say, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna educate our kids? How are we gonna create opportunity? How are we gonna honor the people who are closest to kids? What are we, how are we gonna deal with the problems? How do we find solutions? And he also created this Education Champions, which also worked with us in so many ways that for the first time ever, we had an education debate leading up to the last presidential election. Now, that's the kind of work that Dan um, has done. And I'm really honored to co-sponsor um, that the AFT is co-sponsoring this program with this amazing philanthropist, Dan Leeds. Thank you, Dan. Well, thank you, Randy. That was very nice and appreciate it. Thanks, Steve, and thanks to the wonderful panel. Also, thanks to Cornell. Um, it's sort of, it has been totally foundational to my life. Not only a great education, but that's where I met my wonderful wife and my sons went there. So I recommend it highly. Um, I'm going to take a minute and try to adjust John's question. Why hasn't Congress acted? You know, we all, all of us in here know that the most important investment our parents made was in our education. And we know that the most important investment we make in our future is the education of our children. And the voter polls and statistics show that voters really understand that. It's our government, our political party, and most of our elected officials who really don't get it. So I would say voters are beginning to send the message. Um, you've heard it from Jeff, you've heard it from John, you've heard it from John Bailey and Stan Greenberg. Um, I would say that the poll that sticks in my mind is that 21% of voters say they're gonna vote for a candidate who can have a lot of impact on education. 
And there are eight Senate races in, in this election. There'll be five to eight in 2022 that will be won or lost by 5% of the vote. And if you look at gubernatorial campaigns, they have been decided by education. That's been true in North Carolina, Wisconsin, Michigan, Kansas, Kentucky, and Louisiana. They have been decisively decided by education voters, so you should all hope, have hope. But it's very interesting that Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy, a member of the Senate Health, Education, and Labor Committee said, there's no design denying that voters care about education Polls make that abundantly clear, but in order to make lasting change, there needs to be a political movement with the power to ensure policymakers prioritize education and hold them accountable when they don't. Every major issue has a national organization. Think the League of Conservation Voters or the NAACP. Given the political reality, um, there needs to be a similar education effort to complement the teachers union. And that's why I launched Education Champions. So I just wanna say thanks, Steve. Thanks, uh, Natalie and Emily for launching the Cornell Institute of Politics and for hosting this symposium. Once again, thank you all for joining us and I'll turn it over to Steve. Well, uh, Randy Weingarten and uh, AFT, uh, Dan Leeds, Education Champions, thank you so much. Secretary King and John Bailey, Jeff Garren, Stanley Greenberg, thank you. Uh, for more information about the Institute of Politics uh, at, and Global Affairs at Cornell, you could just Google us so, or go to iopga.cornell.edu. Thursday, former Secretary of State John Kerry. Separately, uh, also on Thursday, Congressman Adam Schiff, Congressman Peter Welch, uh, and former Ambassador Tim Romer talking about the health of democracy. We urge you to pay special attention to this new project that we are launching, the Campaign for the Future of Democracy, a very significant, sophisticated voter research project into the electorate's attitudes on democracy, democratic norms, and democratic values. Again, Randy Weingarten, Dan Leeds, thank you so much for sponsoring this. We hope everybody stays well, stays healthy, and stays safe. Thanks, and if you haven't voted, remember to do that. Bye, everybody.